Uh, earlier this week, the Young Democratic Socialists circulated a petition begging the administration to disinvite me from campus here tonight. Uh, they, they did this because I apparently threatened, quote, the lives of trans and all queer people because, uh, in their words, I am calling for a genocide of trans people. Uh, this was news to me, of course. Uh, a Twitter person by the name of Kate Craig, she describes herself as a, quote, former Tennessee Senate candidate, activist, organizer, writer, photographer, animal rescuer. She's very busy. She's up to a lot of things. Uh, she said that I, quote, literally called for trans people to be exterminated. I'm not sure when I literally did that, but <laughs> Katie Craig says so, so I guess I must have. She went on, she said, quote, there's nothing civil about him. He has called for violence, and we don't need someone calling for violence in our community. These claims and this petition, it came as a big relief to me because they relieved me of the responsibility of writing a speech because these claims themselves proved the thesis of my talk here tonight, which is that the left, bereft of facts and arguments, hoaxes its way to power. It does, it does. This is not a recent phenomenon. The libs have been using this tactic of claiming violent threats where none exist, especially on university campuses, since at least the 1960s. Since that time, violence has occasionally broken out on campus. In virtually every case, it has been the leftists committing the violence. This really all began around 1969 up at Cornell when rifle-wielding student activists stormed and occupied Cornell's Willard Strait Hall. Some of the more senior people in the audience tonight might remember that event. The student radicals kicked out parents who had been visiting their children. The armed occupiers demanded the creation of an Africana Studies Department, and they justified their occupation of the building on the grounds that there was a burning cross the previous night outside of the Black Women's Cooperative on campus. But there was something that didn't quite add up about that burning cross. You see, the Ithaca police were never able to track down those elusive cross burners. In fact, they suspected that members of the Afro-American society themselves set the blaze to justify further protests. This is a suspicion that one of the group's members later confirmed. Stephen Goodwin, who served as a treasurer for the Afro-American society, called the cross burning a setup. Turns out the, the society contrived the hoax, according to Goodwin, quote, to bring more media and more attention to the whole thing. And it worked. The activists got what they wanted. So leftist activists ever since bereft of any real grievance have followed the same strategy of inventing imaginary oppression to advance their interests. In retrospect, it is unbelievable that anybody believed Jussie Smollett. You remember that? Jussie Smollett a little-known actor claimed that two Trump hat-wearing conservative Republicans not only recognized him, but chased him down, <laughs> beat him up, and very gently laid a noose around his neck, all while chanting, this is MAGA country in downtown Chicago, <laughs> a city that has been governed exclusively by Democrats since 1931. Plenty of people actually believed it, including the current president and vice president of the United States, who called it an attempted modern day lynching. And the sandwich survived. <laughs> and the sandwich survived. That's true. That was the silver lining in that incident of terror. <laughs> now, when it became clear that Smollett had staged the whole thing himself, liberals tried to downplay the episode after they'd spent two weeks trying to turn it into a national news story. Liberals insisted that while the Smollett incident might have been a hoax, that it got to a greater truth. That's what they always say. They say, I know we got caught in a lie, but my lie, it speaks to a greater truth somewhere, somehow, I don't know how. The, the greater truth it spoke to was the real epidemic of hate crimes, this nationwide epidemic of terror targeting any and all of the liberals' favored identity groups. But there isn't one. 
time and time again the incidents that liberals tout as justification for advancing their political agenda on race, on sex, on everything, turn out to be hoaxes. It's all Jussie Smollett. It is Jussie Smollett all the way down, especially on campuses. In 2016, three black students accused an Ohio bakery owner named Alan Gibson of racial profiling. Oberlin faculty, staff, and administrators immediately began to protest. The university canceled its contracts with Gibson's Food Mart. The business was ruined and the owner was branded a racist, the worst thing you can possibly be called today. In reality, Gibson had caught the students attempting to steal liquor from the store. The ringleader later admitted as much. Now, fortunately, that hoax had a relatively happy ending in that an Ohio jury eventually awarded Gibson's Bakery more than $36 million from Oberlin. They just bankrupted <laughs> that university. They should have gone a little further than they might have actually bankrupted it. But the paycheck came too late for Alan Gibson, who died during the years that the case was still in litigation. On the very same day that the Oberlin students slandered Gibson as a bigot, Bowling Green State student Elisha Long claimed to have been attacked by rock-hurling white Trump supporters. Instantly, you know what happened. The school administration sent a long emotional letter to the students about the supposed attack. The students began to protest. They invade against racial discrimination, the epidemic of race hate roiling our country in the wake of Donald Trump's election. And then what happened? Same thing that always happens. The student could, or could not keep her story straight. And then cell phone records revealed that she was not even present at the site of the alleged attack. In fact, the only evidence of racism or violence that investigators found was a trove of text messages that Long had sent to her boyfriend disparaging white people and wishing death upon Trump supporters. 2017, a black student activist found a racist threat on her car at St. Olaf College in Minnesota. It was easy for her to find the racist threat because she wrote it herself. <laughs> that same year, five black Air Force Academy cadets wrote racial slurs on their own doors the following November, Finn Arthur, a black student at Goucher College in Maryland, wrote, I'm going to kill all N-I-G-G-E-Rs in a dormitory bathroom. When police discovered the true source of the threatening graffiti, Arthur confessed to having drawn it himself, along with having drawn a backward swastika. Apparently, Arthur didn't know what a swastika looks like. <laughs> and he wrote the dorm numbers of black students, including his own. He blamed his bottled up anger for motivating him to commit the hoax. Whatever the source of his anger, it could not have been racial bigotry, which was so lacking on campus that he had to invent some. But what's especially strange about the case of Finn Arthur is that when you look at his mugshot, you realize he hardly even looks black. He may have had some black ancestors, but Arthur looks like a white guy, making it even more preposterous that skinheads prowling about the campus would have targeted him for a racial attack. Hoax after hoax after improbable hoax. And why? Because the ability to claim victimhood confers power. The power to demand special privileges, the power to upend curricula, the power to pack the university administration with diversity, equity, and inclusion deans and other apparatchiks and all sorts of political activists whose sole job it is to advance the liberal political project. It doesn't even matter if the incidents are eventually revealed to be hoaxes. One, because the media will suppress the revelation. They'll run the hoax on page one, and then they'll re run the correction and the update on page 1,000. But two, because by the time the hoax is revealed to be a hoax, it will have already had its intended political effect. The law will have been passed, the bureaucrat will have been installed, the money for the leftist group will have been raised, and then the activists will just move right along to the next hoax.